Here's, here we go. Uh, look at chapter 36 of chapter 14. Last week we left off where Paul was giving uh, instructions on how the ministry is to operate. In the local ministry in particular, notice in verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And we even ended last session by saying, or Wednesday, about the God of peace. Where peace comes, if you're looking for peace in your life, you first have to find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. That's his name, the Prince of Peace. True peace, where you can relax and rest, comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. But for us believers, it's through the Word. It's joy and peace in believing. And that's what God is, who God is the author of that. Satan is the author of confusion, chaos. He desires a chaotic life, a chaotic world. What's behind all that is the God of this world, little g, Satan, wants to destroy the peace of God. I was saying my primary job as the minister of the bishop here is to maintain the peace of God in the assembly and so forth. Well, that's what Paul says ought to happen in all the churches. By the way, verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. The apostle Paul is the one whom God has sent to man to bring peace, the peace of God. Paul says, I teach everywhere in every church. Unless a church teaches the Pauline grace message, there's no peace, not the peace of God, able to rule in that place. Verse number 34, again, this is in public ministry and so forth. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. We went through the verses as we ended that God put the male in charge, particularly in spiritual things, especially in spiritual things, okay? And women can teach women, they can teach children up to a certain age. I started out as a youth pastor because one of the sisters in the Lord said that when the boys got about 12 or 13, they ceased listening to her. And the reason why, they, became, they, were, they were going through puberty, they were getting testosterone, and their respect for her authority began to wane. I walked right in, I was a young man, this was about 19 years ago, but just the fact that I was M Mr. Ron, or, or pa Pastor Ron, all the boys respected my authority. They, they craved it, I had no problems with it. Usually you see that as boys become men, and, and, and their respect for their mom begins, they begin to challenge that. It's a natural thing. That's where the father, or the brothers, the uncles, and so forth, come in. Well, it's the same under spiritual things. He says, verse 35, and if they will learn anything, that means anything outside that they, they want to understand and so forth, God first puts the onus on the husband. That's why us men, we're called, Ephesians 5, to love our wives and wash them with the war of the word. No, because see, your husband, you're a widow. A widow or someone who's single, if they don't have a husband to ask and so forth, or even a, a son who's not in the grace message, the next level of, of covering would be myself as the minister and so forth. So you don't have anyone that you can go home to, Dodie, to ask these questions. That's why we have the Q&A here, especially if you don't have a spiritual covering. Everybody get that? If you don't have, some, if you're a lady and you don't have a spiritual covering, a husband, a father who knows the grace message, God, the, the next level is the brother, the brothers of the assembly, and that's why we we open a Q and A, just for that fact that if you have questions and you don't have someone at home that you can ask these things, you can ask the the brothers in the Lord, and that's what I'm here as the bishop. So no, great question though. Verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their questions at home for the shame for a woman to speak in the church. And again, this is in context too, Dodie, about the working of those spiritual gifts, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, and so forth. What was going on in Corinth is that they were out of order in their assembly. Look at verse 40. Let all things be done, how? Decently and in order. Now, look at verse 36. Here's how you know they were out of order. Watch what Paul says. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? He's challenging them. He's saying, look, you guys are trying to do it your own way, but God's word didn't originate from you. If you want to get technical, God's word actually originated to the Jewish people. The Jewish people gave the world the Holy Scriptures. And then obviously the Apostle Paul, when he comes, he gives the world the mystery. So really the word of God came out of the Apostle Paul. 
He's saying, why are you messing up the way that God does things? Watch what he says in verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet, now get this, a prophet is that one who has that gift of prophecy, he can speak forth God's word, or spiritual. You have some maturity in the things of God. Here's the number one qualifier for someone who is a spiritual person or someone who speaks for God. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that who? I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is the one whom God has given to give his commandments. And when you're reading your Bible, someone asks me, where to start reading our Bible? If you've never read the Bible and you want to share with someone what to read, these passages right here, and it's not a lot to read, Genesis chapters 1 through 3 and Romans chapters 1 through 3. Watch this. Look, that's only six chapters that someone who never even cracked the Bible open could understand what God's doing. What's happening in Genesis 1 verse through 3? God is the first word of the Bible. In, well, in the beginning, God. He's the first line of the Bible. God is the creator. Hey, hey Brother Rich, how you doing? Let me give you this here, bro. Almost, almost Jesus just had it so nice. <laughs> I almost kept it for myself. I was so dumb, you know, back in the day. God the creator. So you would tell someone, read Genesis chapter 1, because even before they could read Romans, God's word to us today, they need to know who God is. So Genesis 1 through 3, 3, that number of spiritual completions that God had, it explains everything you need to know about God. God's a creator. And he, he created the heaven and the earth. He tells you the sphere of God's creation. It's heaven and earth. Then he tells you about what, what happened to the earth. Why, what, what, what's up with the earth? The earth was not formed and void in darkness. There was, there, was a, there was the wrath of God. There was a, a, a judgment from God. Okay, So you can see something's going on there. Then God the Creator creates man. Where did we come from? Where did we come from? We didn't come from uh, animals. We didn't come from some. Some people think we came from aliens and all this nonsense, or, or some type of evolutionary theory. No, we came the image and likeness of God. We came from God. Okay, so now we know. But not just the male. Where did women come from? The female, Adam and Eve. Ladies, you're female, you're, you're, your name is woman, you're taking out a man. So now you can see all of this stuff taking place. By the way, children, be fruitful, multiply. Where do children come from and why? So that you can subdue the earth for God. Subdue it. Have dominion over it. God created man to control his earth. And now we know through Paul the heavenly places too. So in Genesis 1, 2, 3, by the way, you can see how God created the seven-day cycle Seven days, one day of rest, and so forth. By the way, the hugest thing you can see is the fall of man. Why there's sin and why there's death. And in that, you see the enemy, Satan. So if you can get all that in chapters 1 through 3, you can see some stuff. Now, why Romans 1 through 3? Well, Paul wrote the book of Romans. Paul wrote 13 books of your Bible, more than anyone. Romans through Philemon. Paul is our apostle, so you read his, his books. So when I'm telling people, I tell them to read those three chapters and then these three chapters. What's here in Romans 1? The creator God was rejected by man. Over the course from Adam on to Paul, mankind as a, as a whole, the majority of mankind rejects their creator. They don't want to receive him as God. And they're worthy of death. They're worthy of condemnation. Okay? It says that the creation shows that there's a God. And when you look at creation, Ryan had a good thing about three. Three in creation. We're going to see some of that in, in this study. The number three is the number of the Godhead. One God, three persons. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And everything in creation points to that. Three, three, three. That pyramid. That all-seeing eye. The Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus, and then the Holy Ghost. Or the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's God. That's why they got pyramids everywhere, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hijacked version of what God represents. That's satanic, what they do with it. But God is one God, three persons. Okay, It lasts forever. Those, those, things, those pyramids can exist forever. It's like God. Now, creator, Romans 1, he was rejected. Death. But by the way, in Romans 2, you see that the religious guy doesn't please God. 
whether it's the Jews religion or whatever religion, that moral guy, morality, no, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. No, not one. Everybody is condemned. And that's Romans 2 and 3. And then lastly in chapter 3, you can now learn what the answer is. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. But the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that he died for our sins. Okay? His blood. Now, in a nutshell, if you want to get somebody started in Bible reading, it's that simple. God put Genesis 1 verse 1, chapters 1 through 3, and Paul's book of Romans 1 through 3, those six chapters, six is the number of man. Okay, six represents man. If man wants to know God, read those three and those three, and you'll have a great understanding of the Bible. You know, I was thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The that's three letters. Lord, that's four letters. Jesus, that's five letters. Christ, that's six. It's wonderful how you put that together. And God does that throughout the Bible. You can put those numbers together and work them out. I'll do it later in Q&A, but I was just sitting there yesterday. I go, oh, the, three, four, five. Three, number of the Godhead. Four, the earth. Five, death and grace. Six, man. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God who came to earth to die for man and give them grace. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why every time you call him the Lord Jesus Christ, you're honoring him in who he is. And then even when you add those numbers up, it's some wonderful things. You know how many times the word perfect is in the Bible? How many? 1, 2, 3, 123. 1, 2, 3. Boom. And how many one, times two, in the Old Testament? 66. 66. There's it's your Bible. like the books. Boom. Interesting. Okay. I had a 90-year-old woman that I took say, uh, we, I was taking her to her appointment on Friday. She's 90 years old, and, and I, was, I listen to sports radio, just keep up. And, and some football player says, oh, I don't believe in God. And so the lady heard that on the radio. <laughs> she doesn't know I'm a, a minister. You know, she, she had never rode with me. She, wanted to, you know, she was new to uh, our, our, our senior home. And she said, what do you think, Ryan? Do, do you believe in God? She says, I, I'm not sure I believe in God. I said, I believe in God. <laughs> She goes, you know, that book, that Bible was written by men, and it's all this mistakes in it. And that first thing I said, when somebody said that, you say, oh, really? So you've read the Bible. Well, I haven't really studied it. Oh, well, give me one. Because I go, I've read the Bible. It's an interesting book. Give me a, oh, I don't know all that. So she didn't give me one. But she says, you know, you know how the, the, the people of Israel supposedly had went through the Red Sea? I said, yeah, that's good. She goes, really, it was a tsunami and an earthquake. <laughs> So I said, I said, let me get this straight. I, I'm taking her to her someplace. It's Ten minutes where. So you're saying a tsunami and an earthquake opened up Oh yeah, oh yeah. The wind and okay. I said, so all those Israelites, millions of them, old people, young people, cattle, sheep, all of them went through. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I said, so what happened to Pharaoh and his army? Because the Egyptian armies got destroyed. So the the, the, the Hebrews were able to go, but then the Egyptians. She was like. Oh, I didn't think about that. I said, yeah, people don't think about that. <laughs> then I said, why, how did they even get to the Red Sea? Why would Egypt give up all of their free labor from the Hebrews? And one day he just says, okay, you guys can go. She was like, huh? I was like, they got to the Red Sea, but remember, they had to get out of Egypt. How did they get out? She didn't think of that. I said, do you think Pharaoh just one day said, oh, just go. without?" I said, or could it be that God put such judgments on them, like the Passover, where the death angel killed the firstborn. I'm giving her this lesson, but kind of, you know, gentle on the drive, and she's just looking at me like, wow. She's like, you kind of know this, though. I said, a little bit. I said, a little bit. I said, you've heard of Passover. She says, oh, yeah. There's some Jewish people. I said, where that come from is Exodus 12, when the death angel killed all the firstborn sons. And that was the last plague of 10 that God put on Egypt. And Pharaoh says, okay, get out. So I said, that's, I said, Moses did that through the power of God. And then when we got to the place, I said, next time we're going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the key to everything. Okay? But anyway, that's what I'm saying. People don't believe God. And, or don't believe in God. And, and it's sad that you're 90 and you've been living at least 70 years held accountable to God by your sins. You on the, she's on the brink of death and hell in a lake of fire. Oh, that was Friday. I hadn't seen her yet. I might see her tomorrow. And I'll give her 
the rest of the story if she wants it. Because in Genesis chapter 1, you need to know there's a creator God, that he made the heaven and the earth, he made man. Man is to have dominion, and, and that, but there was a fall and there was a satanic attack on man. And then in Romans 1 through 3, Paul is sent by God to say, look, you're in trouble. And I don't care how religious you are, how more you are, you're in trouble. All of sin comes short of glory of God. But the answer is what? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's going on. When Paul talks about, if you're going to be spiritual, go back to chapter 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There's grace commandments. We're under grace. Paul says in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, the commandments that I've given you. Verse 38. But because God is a God of free will and, 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 and freedom and faith, and the only thing that God can respond to is your faith, and faith needs free will choice, volition. God doesn't force anything. There's a judgment coming for the believer. If you're saved today, this Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, has a throne for believers called the judgment seat of Christ. And shortly when the Lord comes for the body, us, the believer today, if you're saved, you're going to be here. If you're not saved, stay tuned. I'm going to show you how you can be saved. Because if you're not saved when the Lord comes, you're in trouble. Because you think the world is bad now. You think ISIS is bad now. All that stuff in the Middle East. When the believers are taken out of here, it's going to be hell on earth. You don't want to be part of that day. Now is the day of salvation. But if you get saved today, you're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. And everything you've done from your salvation on is going to be judged. And if you don't know Paul's message, you're going to suffer loss. So if you don't know it, you need to get to know it. you got to redeem the time. Well, that's what's going to happen. The Lord's going to do that. And when Paul says, the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord, but if any man be ignorant, listen, don't beat him up with the Bible. Don't run after them. Hey, keep the door open. Say, hey, when you want to know more about God's word, I'm here for you. But if they want to be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, as Paul concludes this chapter about the spiritual gifts that were in operation in that day, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. That means have that ability to speak plain words so that people can understand God's word. And forbid not to speak with tongues. He's saying, I don't have any problem with that gift of tongues that was in operation. But he just says, no matter what you do in that assembly, let some things be done. Let all things be done decently and in order. There is a decorum to a local assembly. God has designed the local assembly to allow us to work out our salvation. That's why we exist. God says it's the pillar and ground of the truth. There should be a place that you can go and say, here is the truth. Now again, thank God for technology. Brother Ryan coming from a death show each day. Because he, he's getting edified. He's, he's getting comfort from us. But in his labor of love, he's getting it out to others. Because sadly, in these last days, ministers aren't faithful to the Pauline Grace message. And therefore, people don't have a grace church to go to. Okay? We've had people move here. There's Rondell. Just walk, she comes from the other side of the country. Because you need that live physical fellowship. As well as, for those who don't have it, we can thank God that we have the studies out there. But there's that comfort in meeting with saints. Okay? All right. Let's keep going. Verse number Chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, so Paul, is, he's dealt with the spiritual gifts in, uh, uh, issue. Now he's going to move on to another thing. The Corinthians asked him all these questions. One thing about babes, children, they ask a lot of questions, don't they? Mm -hmm. I notice, I know when people are growing in the, in the truth, that as they're growing, their questions not only become more mature, but they begin to diminish a little bit. Because they're learning, they're being established in truth. And Paul had to deal with these carnal children, Corinthians, so he had to constantly give them. He wrote 16 chapters. It's got to be the longest one. I, I, I didn't even think about that right off. 16, 2 Corinthians 13. That's, that has to be the longest one. You've got Romans 16, but that's the foundational book. Yeah, so it's tied for the longest book. 
But Romans is the foundational book, so he has to put all that in there. Corinthians, these are saved people that, that he's dealing with all types of issues and problems because they rejected Pauline truth and it's caused confusion. So now he's going to deal with something that they were confused about. And for now, I'm going to erase this, okay? If you ever want to share with somebody what to read in the Bible, tell them to read Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then follow that up with Romans 1, 1 2, and 3, and they got it. He's going to deal with the issue of the physical, physical, a real, literal, not some type of faith or something spiritual, real, literal, physical, bodily resurrection. Res, sorry, resurrection. All right, so... Do people, do, do people rise from the dead? Yes. The proof is the Lord Jesus did. Let's look at it. Verse, chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that's the good news given to the apostle, which I preached unto you. In Acts chapter 18, Paul went to Corinth and preached to them. There was, there was a Jewish synagogue there, or Jewish synagogues, and he went in there and proved who Jesus Christ was, that he, Jesus was the Christ, and then that he died for sins, was buried and rose again. We're going to see that as we look at this study. Watch this. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. They received it back in the day. And wherein ye stand, watch this, there's a standing here, by which also ye are saved. Now notice the next word. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now before we move on, I must put this up on the board. Every time you see the word saved, it doesn't mean saved from, your, from the penalty of your sins. If you see saved, it's a word that you always have to ask, saved from what? Saved or salvation? We always think, oh, from the penalty, right? Hell and the lake of fire. And while it's true that when you trust Christ, you will never go to hell or the lake of fire. That's saved from the penalty of your sin. Okay? The penalty. Eternal penalty. Okay? Eternal penalty. That's your justification or salvation. Now, I'm going to say it like this. Your position. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, he shed his blood on the cross, that moment God saves you forever. That's grace. Religion won't tell you that. They'll say you have to do some works to be saved. Do some works to stay saved. If you're not living a proper life, maybe you didn't get saved. Uh-huh. But Paul and God never said that. If you trust the blood of Christ, Romans 3, you're saved in your position. You have positional salvation in Christ. You never lose that salvation. That's God's grace. But then there's another salvation. That is on a that that's that's your position, okay? There's a there's another salvation. That's that's a salvation. You're saved on a daily basis from the power of sin, okay? The power of sin. This one is the penalty of sin. This is the power of sin. This is your walk, your, 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 your daily walk. As you learn the Word of God, what you guys are doing today is you're learning the Word of God. What that's going to save you is from confusion of Satan. So you're saved from the confusion of Satan, because God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. And from the power of sin, you're going to allow that, that those sins in your member to not have dominion over you. That's the one Paul is talking about, this one right here. They were being confused by Satan about the real, literal, physical body resurrection. Now there's a third salvation that's future. One day we're going to be saved from the wrath to come. We're going to be delivered out of this world. Okay, We're going to be saved from the... the, the, the I'll say it like this, the, the wrath of God, the wrath to come. That's what Paul called it. Now that's going to be what the Bible, what we call the rapture, okay? Where God comes, Christ comes, and he takes us out of here before the wrath. But you, what the Apostle Paul calls it is the resurrection, 2 Timothy, okay? At that event called the rapture, all the dead in Christ are going to get new bodies and be raised together. Their soul is with the Lord, but their bodies are down here waiting for the resurrection. You and I, if we're blessed enough to be, and I do believe strongly, 
in my heart, we're gonna, we're, we are that generation that we people right now today could be that group of saints that are not, we don't die, we're just changed in the moment. We're caught up. But it's still a resurrection. We're going to be raised never to die again. That's the issue, okay? Is there a physical, is there a real, literal, physical, bodily resurrection? The answer is yes. The Lord Jesus Christ really rose from the dead in an actual physical body of flesh and bone. Let's look at it. Chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. By the way, that's the gospel of God that, that's about the resurrection of his son, okay? The gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. See, notice, they stand in it, okay? That, that what God has done is, is a truth. It's real. Now, if you remember this fact, and he's going to tell you the fact in a moment, by which ye also ye are saved, if, this is a salvation from confusion, okay? If you keep in memory, you got to remember what Paul says about stuff. I always tell people the answer to your problems is what that says the scriptures through the Apostle Paul. When people ask me about stuff, I say, let's see what the Apostle Paul says about it. Uh, Ryan, the other day at the store, I hear this, this guy speaking in a foreign, kind of foreign accent. And I said, that sounds familiar. It was our guy, your ball this, okay? Right, right. So I, I, I told him, I said, hey, man, we missed you. It was right down Safeway, right up on um, Winding Way in Manzanita. Did he remember you? Uh, uh, Safe Mart. Yeah, he remember me. Nice. He was looking at me. He said, oh, yeah, that good dinner going to your church. And I go, so what happened? Your ball this Brian and I talk about you at least once a month. Every time I see somebody talk against Paul, I remember you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you later, but yeah, I remember what you all did. In memory, what I preached unto you. You all this was taking a look, a, a shots at the Apostle Paul to the point where I moved away from just in case God wanted to send his lightning bolts down. Okay? <laughs> Listen, you can't be attacking the Apostle Paul. Your, your attitude towards the Apostle determines your reward as well. First, he said, Be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. It's not just the message, it's the messenger. Why you think the Muslims ready to cut your head off? You say something bad about Muhammad, the prophet, because to them the Quran and the prophet go together. Well, for us believers, the word of God for us today and the Apostle Paul they're tied together. Paul says some indeed preach Christ, but they they want to do it to attack me. God's gonna avenge the apostle on those men. Well, notice he says here. Verse 3, so when you read Acts chapter 18, you see him go into that Jewish synagogue and preach Christ to them and that he died. Notice he says, for I delivered, verse 3, unto you, first of all, what's the first of all? How that, oh, excuse me, first of all, that, that which I also received. By the way, Paul received this not from man. Uh, hold your hand here. Let's go to Galatians. Let you see that. Go with two books forward to Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians chapter number 1. The Apostle Paul did not receive his gospel, good news, his glad tidings from a man. Well, he did. The man Christ Jesus. Not from human, but the man Christ Jesus. God's son. Uh, notice here, verse number 11. Galatians 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It's not from man's origin. When that old lady told me, that old believer, when she said, ah, that book is just, I go, yes, it's from man, but I say it's by inspiration of God. God, didn't we see that God chose humanity to, 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 to do his will? All scriptures given by inspiration of God, holy man spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Peter said. Listen, it's not after man, it's not from man's origin. Watch this. Verse 12, for I neither received it of man. Peter and them didn't give it to him, nor the man. Neither was I what? Taught it. It was a direct new revelation from the Lord Jesus called the mystery. But by revelation of Jesus Christ. See, Paul was given something that God gave no other man before him called the mystery. That gospel given to the apostle. My gospel. Now go back, if you will. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 3. While you get there, I'll get a little step here. Notice what he says in verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He says, I received it of the Lord. 
how that Christ, by the way, Christ has to focus on his sufferings and glory. Uh, the word, you remember I put the Lord Jesus Christ on there? The, the Lord or Jesus Christ. Six. Each of the, the, the only one. Lord, the righteous judge. Jesus, the, the perfect man in his humanity, his humanity. Christ, the one who suffers but is glorified. Suffering and glory. So when Paul calls him Jesus, the focus is humanity. When he calls him Christ, he's focused on his sufferings and his glory. He's, when he calls him the Lord, he's called him the righteous judge. And when he says, the, he's the only, the, the, the only wise God. The, that's why you, you will listen to denominations. They'll say Jesus this and Jesus that, Jesus this. They just spoke of that. His name, his, his given his full glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God the Father names him. Giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow things in heaven, things on earth, things under earth, and that every, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's keep going. So how did Christ, verse 3, die for our sins? Now notice, according to the scriptures. Well, now if you think, you say, well, wait a minute, Brother Ron. Paul received this. But he says, according to the scriptures. Yes. Keep reading. Verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, what's going on there? Well, remember, go back to Acts chapter 18 when he went to Corinth. Go back to Acts chapter 18. Paul's revelation of the mystery doesn't mean that the things spoken of about the Messiah, the Christ, weren't prophesied, okay? Paul calls his preaching the preaching of the cross, but the cross was prophesied. It's the meaning of the events, the meaning. He's not saying that the events were a mystery. The events were no mystery. It's the cross according to the revelation of the mystery. That's right. It's the meaning of the events, particularly for the heavenly places, for the Gentiles, particularly for the heavenly places, and for us Gentiles, as well as Israel, Israel's fall, okay, all these things. But here's the point. When Paul talks about according to the scriptures, certain events happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. His crucifixion, we're going to see some things. His death, his burial, his resurrection. It was foretold. It was foretold, sure. But the meaning of those events was kept secret. If Satan would have known what God was going to do through that cross for the heavenly places and the Gentiles, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So the events of the crucifixion were prophesied. They were, they were made known, the events. But as far as what God's doing today, the meaning of those events was kept secret. That's why it's called the mystery. Okay? So let's separate that. But notice what he says here. Go to chapter 18. of When Paul first went to Corinth, go to chapter 18 of Acts. Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, there are Jews in that assembly and Gentiles. People who come like the Apostle Paul out of the history of the nation of Israel, knowing the law, and then a bunch of heathens like us who didn't have nothing to do with God, the God of the Hebrews, the scriptures, and so forth. Now notice what he says here. He's going to say, listen, all the way through the Old Testament, God says that his son would die, but that his, he's going to send his son the, the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Christ, okay, the Christ. And not only that, but that Christ would die, be buried, and resurrected. All of that stuff was prophesied. You can go and look and say yes. And that's what Paul would, how he would talk to the, to the Corinthians. Let's, let's go there. Look at chapter 18 of Acts, verse 1. <laughs> After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to what? Corinth. So now he, 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 he comes to Corinth. He writes the book of Corinthians, obviously, to the people at Corinth, the saints of Corinth. Now go down for time's sake. Go down to verse number... Well, start, well you, can, you can go to verse 5. Oh, no, that's what I'm talking about. Verse 4. 18.4. Uh, and he, that's Paul, 
reasoned in the what? Synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So the Corinthian church was made up of saved Jews and Gentile Greeks. But Paul would go into the synagogues, the congregation of those Jews, where they, they had the law and the prophets and the Psalms. They had the Old Testament. And Paul would take those Old Testament scriptures and prove that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, what, 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 what Dodi was talking about, go down to verse seven, 11. Verse 11. In fact, verse 9. Verse 7. I said 7. Verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to a synagogue. Imagine sharing a common wall with a synagogue. Verse 8. And Crispus, he gets saved later, by the way, first friend. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, he's a Jew, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing what? Believed and were baptized. Okay? Particularly those Jews at, at, at Corinth. Verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by in the night by a vision. So as Paul is at Corinth, the Lord Jesus appears to him and says, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. The Lord is prophesied. Paul, sh spread the good news, because there are going to be some people going to believe me. There's much people in this city. Okay? Verse 11. So because of that, Paul stays there. Verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when, okay, so stuff happened, uh, go down to, now we go down to, where, no, where was it? No, that's it. I just want you to see, okay, we got that. So you see he was there, right? And what he was doing, he'd go into the synagogue, go back up to verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. So Paul would take the Old Testament scriptures and prove to these Jews, particularly, that Jesus, the man Jesus, was the actual Christ, okay? He was the one who God sent. He suffered and he rose from the dead. Now that's the that's verse twenty-eight, right? The final verse. Oh, that's the one I was looking for. Thank you, thank you. Verse twenty-eight. Now this is Apollos. This is another brother, but thank you, Ryan. I was thinking about this verse too. Look at verse twenty-eight, Acts eighteen twenty-eight. That's Apollos. For he Apollos mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing. Oh, thank you. This is the one I was looking for, Ryan. Showing by the what? The scriptures, the holy written word of God. That who was Christ? Jesus. Jesus was Christ. And so, according to the scriptures. Now, which scriptures would Paul and Apollos use to convince Jews that Jesus was Christ? Well, yeah, Old Testament. But let's go look at some of them. Exactly, Mother. The Old Testament prophesied. Let's go through some of these. we got about 20 minutes, so let's go through some of these and see... How would Paul and Apollos minister to these Jews to prove Jesus was the Christ? Well, go all the way back, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. Remember I said you could show somebody about what God's going to do with the first three chapters of the Bible and the first three chapters of Paul's epistles, and they can get a foundation of what God's doing, who God is and what he's doing in the world. You only need those six books designed by God for man to say, all right, Here's three here to complete your Old Testament. Here's three here to, to help you in the New Testament. You, you, you got a foundation. Those three chapters, or six chapters, three and three. In Genesis chapter number, what did I take? Three, after the fall, notice what God says to the serpent. Genesis chapter number three and uh, 15. Uh, Start at verse 14 for context. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, you know, fooled the woman, Thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, there's going to there's gonna be a, 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 a warfare between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. You ever heard of the seed of the woman? Ultimately, that's the Messiah of Israel, okay? It shall, if the seed of the woman, the Messiah, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what that is, it's a picture of Christ smashing, because if you're going to kill a serpent, you've got to smash his head in, right? Because they slip something, you've got to smash their head in. 
Well, he's going to get a little bruise. You know, he's going to he's going to suffer a little bit, but the, the, the other one's going to be destroyed, and ultimately Satan will be destroyed in the lake of fire. And Christ defeated him through the cross. Okay, now. You see, that's the first one. And what that's called is the proto-evangelist. It's the first good news. And what Israel and what the world before Israel was looking for is the seed of this woman who would be the, that, that, that chosen one. That's why Satan tried to, he tried to uh, disrupt what God was doing and, and, and harm the seed line by having those angels come down in Genesis 6 and, and have marriages with human women and they create this race of giants. He was trying to disrupt that seed line. And so what God did, he flooded those people out, chose Noah and his sons, and used that family, bring Abraham through Shem, and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, the Lord Jesus, David, the Lord Jesus. God was narrowing down that seed line to Jesus, okay? All right, let's keep going. A couple other passages you can look at. Uh, go over to the book of Psalms. Go over to the book of Psalms. Uh, by the way, I mean, uh, on the way there, stop at Deuteronomy. Moses told him. Deuteronomy chapter number... See, Deuteronomy chapter number 18. Deuteronomy chapter number 18. Yeah, look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Even as Moses is about to die, after 40 years in the wilderness with Israel, he gives the, a new, a new a second giving of the law to the little children who grew up over 40 years. The old people died out and the new ones came, particularly the men of war died out who caused Israel to stumble and unbelief. The new generation is going in through Joshua. Joshua is Jesus, same name, Hebrew, Jesus. And he's going to take them to the promised land before, after Moses dies. But before he dies, notice what God says to Moses. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. <laughs> people, <laughs> people who don't like right division, I'll get, I'll, get, I'll get people say, all you talk about is Paul, Paul, Paul. You, <laughs> you just go through Paul's once you ever go through the Old Testament, I said, you, ain't, you haven't seen one message of mine ever in your lifetime. We go through, you probably go through more Old Testament passages with me than any, any right? I, well, yeah, we go through the Old Testament all the time. I could just tell that person just wanted to, was just upset because they didn't know nothing. That's what it is. They ain't never watched nothing. We go through all these verses. Look at Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, Unto him ye shall hearken. When the Lord came and they said, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? They would say, Some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or that prophet. What prophet? That prophet. That prophet, like unto Moses. The Lord Jesus came in the stead of Moses. He was the great, he was the, the, the giver of the word of God. Okay? That's what he's talking about. So Moses even predicted to people of Israel, One day God's going to send someone just like me. Him shall you hearken unto. Verse number 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brother, brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. The Lord Jesus was the living word of God. Everything he spoke was the Father word gave, gave him. Verse number 19. It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he will, shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. What God says, I'm going to hold him accountable. And what I want you to see is that this chosen one, this Messiah was prophesied. But not just that he would come, but that he would die. Go over to the book of Psalms. Go to Psalm. Go to Psalms chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22. And so I, I put myself, I said, what would Paul do? The apostle and Apollos would just go through these Old Testament passages, laying a case like a lawyer. That's it's a fact, that's the language he's using. He's, he's giving evidence. Forensic evidence from the Holy Scriptures that you can trust. And he's saying Messiah was prophesied, but it was prophesied that he would die too. Look at Psalm chapter 22, down at verse 16. This is a, what they call a messianic psalm. Uh, particularly why he was uh, going through his passion and, and on the cross. Look at verse number 16. For dogs have compassed me. Now he's not talking about the four you know, the four legged beast, man's best friend. He's talking about a bunch of heathen Roman Gentiles who are sitting there, ha ha ha, the king of the Jews. Yeah. 
They took some thorns that thick and put them on him. He took Adam's curse upon his own head. And they're mocking him. They beat him. They, 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 they cast lots for his garments. He had this, they put this purple robe. Here's your, your royalty, your, your, your highness, mocking him. And he says, these dogs accomplish me, Father. They're just, they're like beasts. Verse number six, 16, for dogs encompass me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They were all around them. They pierced my what? Hands and my feet. How was the Lord Jesus Christ killed? He was crucified. Prophesied, right? This is written before crucifixion was even invented. Yes, great point. This was written even before they, that was used. I believe the Assyrians first used, but before they even used that as a, as a common uh, 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 execution, crucifixion, it was written in the Holy Scriptures. Mm. Pierce my hands and my feet. Um, we're going to end in Isaiah, but we're not going to go there right now. I just want to see some things. Go over to, um, go over to the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Isaiah 53 is where we're going to end because it's the greatest one. I, 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 was, I, was, I was reading this, this uh, little unbelieving Jew was, was writing some stuff. He was like, oh, you Christians, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. He, go, he, he did admit this. He goes, but there's one passage that we can't deal with. I can't figure out, and it's Isaiah 53. Now, that's the passage that's going to really go. But Paul would have given them the timeline of things, too, from Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter number 9. Go over to the, the prophet Daniel chapter number 9. And in Daniel chapter number 9, notice, uh, when we talk about the 70th week of Daniel, if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about it. We can talk in the Q&A. Verse 24, God gave Daniel a timeline of when the Messiah would come and when he set up his kingdom and so forth, and, and God dealing with Israel, the wrath, dealing with just everything. Verse 24, 70 weeks, and that's weeks of years, it's 490 years. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, that's Israel, upon thy holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, that means to finish it, and to anoint the most holy, bring the, the temple. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. So that's 49 weeks, particularly for the building and so forth. And three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be, what's that word? Cut off. Now with the Jews cut off means you're going to die. Now watch this. But not... For who? Himself. Interesting. Sacrifice. He's going to be the sacrifice. Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, not for himself. Ah. So Messiah is going to. Who's Messiah? He's coming, but he's going to die, man. He's going to be cut off. Okay? Let's keep going. Uh, you and Daniel go forward a few books to uh, Zechariah. Go to Zechariah. Zechariah. Few books, okay. We're gonna stay in here. We're gonna look at something from Jonah as well, because I just want to see it's in the it's in the Old Testament, it's in the Law, it's in the Prophets, it's in the Psalms, the major and minor. Prophets. It's everywhere through the Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scripture that Messiah would not only come. By the way, I can't even get into it today. Where he would be born, Bethlehem. Where he would live, Nazareth. What tribe, Judah. How yeah, about that? Out of the tribe of Judah shall he that be born judge Israel, whose goings are from everlasting, forever. He's, he's an everlasting one. The Jews should have known he's claimed to be God because he's from everlasting. All right? That's in, the, that's in the prophets. Well, I want you to look here at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. They have no excuse not to know that Jesus, by the way, that he would come, where he would be born, Bethlehem, where he would live, Nazareth, to whom he would be born? Behold, I give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and be with child. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government should be upon his shoulder. He should be called the Prince of Peace and, and the Mighty God, all these things, the Everlasting Father. Out of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, shall he come, who is Prince of, of, of Israel, the governor, and he's going, his goings forth have been from everlasting. Even his deity should have been known. Just like it is today when you share the rightly divided word, either people's hearts want to believe God's word or they don't. And Israel should have known 
they didn't want to believe him. Even when he showed up, let me show you what they did to him. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, when he returns, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. Oh yeah, John says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. I will pour that spirit of grace. That's going to be the Holy Spirit in that day and of supplications. And they, everybody got verse 10? Keep reading. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. As one mourning for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one. Listen, the Messiah, even in his resurrection, he tells Thomas, oh, down Thomas, listen, feel me. Put your hands in the nail holes. He still had the nail imprints in his hands and feet. He still had the hole in his side where the Roman soldier, to make sure he was dead, stuck that spear. The spear of destiny, they call it. Supposedly, got all the way down to Hitler and stuff. So super stiff. Because it had the blood of Jesus on that thing and everybody. No, forget the spirit. Look, at, look for him. He's the issue. Talk about, is that his shroud? Is that his burial garment? Forget the burial garment. Look to him. Worry about these little things. Look to the one, the one, the living one. That he's pierced. By the way, this was written way before he was even born. Okay? He died for our sins. It said. Um, other passages of resurrection before we go. Um, it's so many. But I want to end in Isaiah 53, but go back to Psalm chapter 16. Go back to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. By the way, I can show you even more. When God told Abraham, go offer your son Isaac, Hebrews says it was just like the, the, the resurrection of Christ. It says, God told Abraham, go offer your son. It says, after three days, Abraham came to the place. When Jonah, we are not going to go there, but when Jonah was in the well belly, Christ says, I'm going to give you guys a sign, you unbelieving heathen, uh, 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 Pharisees. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be good hearted. When they saw him go in that tomb, it was a sign, you're going to raise again. The Jews have a saying that the Almighty does not like let the righteous uh, be in distress more than three days at a time. Interesting. Just weird things that the Jews have come to know. Three. Christ died. He was buried on the third day. He rose again. All these numbers. Three. Three. By the way, it represents the Godhead. A guy, a guy emailed me and said, Brother Ron, I've been listening to you. I'm confused about something. Can you tell me who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? He says, was it God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. <laughs> yes. Destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up, the Lord says. Paul says in Romans 8, he says, If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell, the spirit of him, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Father says, Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me. God the Father raised him, yeah. God, he raised himself, yeah. The Holy Ghost raised him, yeah. Three is the number of God. And all the Godhead was involved in the resurrection of the, of, the, of the Lord Jesus Christ out of that grave. Well, look at Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 10. Um, start at verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me. This is a messianic psalm. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in what? As his body was on that slab in that tomb before he dies his father into the hand of him in my spirit he gave up the ghost but he says my flesh to rest in hope why let's keep reading verse, verse 10 for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell the place of the part of dead he wasn't going to stay there neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see what corruption, corruption. thou wilt show me path of life when Lazarus died he was in that tomb four days Four is the number of the earth. His body began to corrupt and stink, it said. His, his sister says, Lord, <clears throat> you don't want to open that tomb. His body stinks, she says. Yeah, it was the king, not the Lord. His body there three days, and then the spirit of life came and put, brought him back. Gave him a new body, by the way. We're going to get a new body. But notice, neither shall thy son of thy holy run to seek corrupt. His body wouldn't corrupt. 
Paul says this corruption shall put on incorruption. But his body didn't corrupt. Because Lazarus was in there four days. Four is the number of the earth. You're dealing with something of God's origin when it comes to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and ours. That's why some of us are not going to even die. It's going to be mortality put on immortality at the rapture, the resurrection. Uh, go with me, if you will, to Isaiah 53, and we'll get in there. Isaiah 53. You could read that passage time and time again, and if you could never, I mean, I always rejoice when I read that passage. Isaiah 53. Of all the passages that I went through, kind of building the Messiah, I didn't even go over it. I mean, Paul, he had time to say, okay, Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. He'd grow in, in, in Nazareth. Um, he'd, and then all the other passages, he's eternal from everlasting. But what I want you to see is what he did. When he says Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, okay? The fact, the events, is in Scripture. Now, next, sun, next Sunday, we'll get into that this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, where we look at not just events, but the meaning of events for us, okay? So you be with us. Now, notice, chapter 53. I'm just going to read down and comment. It'll take about five or eight minutes, and then we'll be done. Verse 1. Who hath believed our report, Isaiah says, to the Lord? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When you bear your arms, you're saying you have strength. Particularly that right arm is the Messiah. For he shall, now this is the Messiah, for he shall grow up before him, the Father, as a tender plant. He came from nowhere. <clears throat> and as a root out of a dry ground, that root of Jesse, he hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Lord Jesus wasn't this handsome, you know, uh, uh, um, charismatic looking guy like the, the Antichrist. He wasn't trying to, he wasn't a politician. He was a regular, they said, what does he look like? When he was on earth as Jesus, so much so that when, when the, his disciples, without Judas was in the garden, Judas says, I'll show you which one it is, I'll just give him a kiss. I'll betray him with a kiss. Because if you looked at him, he was the a, a same height as them, bushy, dark hair, beard, and all that stuff, the way a Jew would look. He looked no different. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected of men. A man of, by the way, when you believe the truth like him, you're going to listen to some of these things. People are not going to like you just because you are you, you, you stand for truth. Despised and rejected of men. Now that happened to you. You keep sharing the truth. A man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. You know what the Bible says about sorrow and grief? Ecclesiastes 1.18 says, With much wisdom comes much sorrow. With much understanding comes much grief. He, had, he knew everything. He had the wisdom of Almighty God. And everywhere he looked, it was just sorrow and grief. You, you would feel that way of just sin all around you. You should feel that way a little bit even now as a grace believer. Sorrow, acquainted with grief. And what did Israel do? We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. They didn't esteem him highly in love for the, being the son of God. That parable, he says, I'll, I send my prophets, my servants. They killed him, they killed him. They said, I know they'll reverence my son. And when he sent his son, they murdered his son. They didn't esteem the son of God. Verse 4. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They looked upon that cross and said, If you be the Son of God, come down. We'll believe you. You saved others, can you not save yourself? Oh, physician, heal thyself. All that stuff mocking our Lord. Okay? The one they mock is the judge of all. The, the righteous judge at that great white throne is going to sit and say, You're not mocking now. You're not mocking now. Verse number five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. See, remember he says, but not for himself. He says, the chastisement of our peace, he's the prince of peace, he took God's wrath, was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. This, this is Israel, but this is humanity, isn't it? And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. God made him sin for us. God made his soul, well, just keep reading. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Oppression, because he was a poor man. You know what society do? They oppress the poor. He was afflicted. They take advantage, they afflict him. Yet, before Pontius Pilate, he was silent. Yet he opened not his mouth. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, said, you're a Jew, I'm the governor, I can have you crucified. He says, man, 
You have no power over me except it was given from above. The one who delivered you, me to you has the greater sin. See, God weighs sin. Judas had more responsibility because he walked with Jesus, our Lord. Pontius didn't know this guy from a hole in the wall. Heard a little bit about him. His wife said, I had a dream about this man. We'll leave him alone. But Pontius, because of his, his uh, political ambition and fear of the Roman government and all this other stuff, little sh snake, he washes his hands, but then he's still crucified to appease the Jews. You want to know why they appeased Islam today? The same thing going on. Attack Christendom appeased. It, that, that's all it is. He was doing it back then too. Notice. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. There's his death. But not for himself, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And we now know from the Apostle Paul, it was for us too. Keep going. He made his grave with the wicked. There's his burial. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus says they begged the body of Jesus. He says he's dead. Let us bury him. They put him in a rich man's tomb. Let's keep going. Verse 9. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done how much violence? No. No violence, neither was any deceit found in his, in his deceit in his mouth. Oh, we're coming down to the crescendo. 10, 11, 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Thou shalt bruise his heel. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for what? Sin. By the way, the reason Jesus needed blood is because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. The blood is given to an atonement for the altar and atonement of the soul. Everybody needs a blood sacrifice. Walk up to your friends and family and they say, hey, you know you need a blood sacrifice to be right with God. Say, what are you talking about? You do. You need some blood. You need some shedding of blood. And today, it's not the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for your sins. And if you're not covered with the blood of Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. Trust him today. Trust his shed blood for your sins. Notice, God made his soul, verse 10, an offering for sin. But he shall, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, there's his resurrection, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Not only is he going to be resurrected, he's going to rule for God. Verse, verse 11, here's God the Father. He, God the Father, shall see the travail of his soul and be what? Satisfied. That word propitiation in Romans 3, a fully satisfying payment. God says, I'm satisfied, son. You took my wrath upon yourself. I'm not a man, but a worm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, turn their backs on God the Son because of you and me, us. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, your presence now. He says, I'm not a man, but a worm. And for those six hours on the cross, but particularly the three hours of darkness, the wrath of God was poured out on the sun. For us. He did it for us. Keep going. Verse number 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. He, God's going to give it to the son, and the son's going to give it to some other people, like us. Join heirs, if you trust him today. You believe his word to Paul. Because he had poured, <coughs> because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, the thieves on the cross there, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. There's not a greater passage to take a Jew or anybody to outside of the dispensation of grace than that passage. I would couple that. We got to end, but <clears throat> if you just want to deal with somebody, Genesis chapters 1 through 3, Romans chapters 1 through 3. But if you, a good supplement to that would be Isaiah 53. Because then you can see the effects of this, the effects of this, but here, here are the mechanics of how it all happened right there. You can see what happened to them, okay? With those passages, you can't go wrong. 
If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Jesus Christ, our Lord, went through all this so you can know for sure. Your religion won't tell you this. Your denomination won't tell you this. They'll say, well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Ask a lost person, are you going to go to heaven or hell? Well, hopefully my good outweighs my bad. Uh, that's not the answer. Uh -huh. you got to be perfect to go to heaven. you got to have no sin. And only one man ever had no sin, and that's the Lord Jesus. And he shed his blood so that you could say, Father, I don't have anything but the blood of Christ. He says, get up. That's all you need. That's all you need. But if you don't have the blood of Christ, you don't know for sure. You've got to know now, the day of salvation. Religion can't tell you that. They say, oh, maybe you got some works you didn't do. Have you been living this life? Oh, you've been doing all oh, you've been doing that. You know, can't do that. Don't do that. Maybe not do that. I'm not sure. You're not sure. I've had, I've had pastors come. But Ron, I'm not sure. I think I committed the unpardonable sin. I said, oh, boy. <laughs> Get out the pulpit right now. Stop it. <laughs> unpardonable sin. That ain't even thing. There's no sin unpardonable today except unbelief. If you die in unbelief of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can't save you because you rejected your, 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 the, the, the payment, the blood. Just trust him. God will save you from this moment on. You can rest and say, I ain't got to worry about hell no more. Christ paid my sin day. He, he His blood. Then what to do after that? Well, the, the, the judgment seat of Christ is coming. After you're saved, God wants you to grow in the knowledge of your Savior, the Lord Jesus. He's looking to, to exalt you in a position where you serve him forever, but you've got to serve him by faith now. And you can only do it through the rightly divided understanding of God's word, where to find your doctrine. And it's found in Paul's epistles, Romans and Philemon. It's all of God's word rightly divided. We'll help you understand the Bible and build Christ in you. He's looking for some people who are strong in faith so he can divide the spoil with the strong. We can be that. We'll help you with that, okay? That's why we have this ministry. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in Him. We thank you that we can get into your word each and every day. Thank you for this book, this Holy Scripture. But what a blessing it is to come with those of white precious faith. And you created that dynamic of fellowship, uh, the fellowship in your son, the fellowship of the mystery. It's designed to build and edify people like no other. So we thank you for this opportunity to come together today to worship you corporately. May these things we learned about your son today Give us a greater appreciation of him. And that's what, the, that's what it's all about. Giving us a greater appreciation of the Lord Jesus. And then that would motivate us to serve him more. To get to know him more. Thank you for your holy son who shed his blood on that cross for our sins. Thank you that just as he was physically resurrected, we too. And we'll talk more about that next week. But we just give you thanks and praise for this time, Father. We, we, we ask in the name of your glorious son, our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.